Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Wow, it's been a great couple of days, and I haven't had an intro like that in a long time. So today, um, I want to talk to you about something you probably haven't seen before, and that's how to build innovation communities with influencers that turn ideas into revenue. Now, most people think, how can all these things to go, go together? But I'm, I'm going to tell you. But first of all, um, before I get started, I did want to thank Spigot for putting on this conference and inviting me and having me be the closing keynote. I mean, they've, they've, they must be drinking something to have me be the closing keynote. But maybe we can all thank them by clapping our hands. It's, it's been great. <clears throat> I've, I've learned a lot, and I'm going to apply what, a lot of what I've learned to my everyday career. I do a lot with companies. I set up innovation programs using influencers. I'm going to talk a little bit about how I do that and how you can benefit from it. And I guarantee you it will change the way you do innovation programs in the future. But first, do you all remember the video that Clab Lab did with Sir Ken Robinson? Well, I was a little jealous of that. Nobody's ever done that for me. So I had the guys prepare something for me. that is done on a mobile phone? I mean, I don't know how they do it. And they all produce the music. And it sounds very professional. So I like to tell stories. And before I get started into my influencers, innovation, what does this all mean? I'm going to bring you back to high school. So I went to high school in California. And uh, it was a public school, it wasn't a private school. Maybe a lot of you went to private school. I didn't, I went to public school. And back then it was when red pen was you know, outlawed. You couldn't use red pen in my school because it might upset the kids. Because, and, and I didn't really learn how to write. I didn't learn how to read very well. You know, I could go on and on about some of the things that happened to me in my California high school. It wasn't that I couldn't read, I wasn't the best reader. And so it, it turns out, I wasn't alone in my high school. And the board of superintendents was coming down on the school. Now, I didn't know all this at the time. And the principal got very worried that most of the people in the school couldn't read very well, for whatever reason. I think I know the reason, but we'll get to that. So the principal came to me, of all people, and asked me to help them design a reading program so that everybody in my peer group, I had a large peer group, uh, would learn how to read, or at least not learn how to read, but read better. They weren't at the standards of the rest of the state uh, or the rest of the country. So they came to me and they said, Mark, we know you can't read very well, but you read better than everybody else. So my high school principal came to me and, and said, let's design a program together. Let's do this together. I, I know what we're doing today isn't working, I want your help in designing a reading program so that we get your peer group to start reading. 
So that's exactly what I did. I saw it as an initiative. I saw they were holding me up. I've never been held up before in my life at this point. And they said, you help us design it. So what, that's what I did. I picked out the books. I designed the reading program myself. And sure enough, make a long story short, sure enough, because I chose sports magazines and magazines uh, with you know, like Sports Illustrated uh, swimsuit covers, as long as they read these magazines and they're motivated to do so, they started reading more. And test scores did go up. So my principal was very smart in getting me involved in that and influencing my peer group, peer group because when the program was finished, when we designed this program, I was bought into that program and I decided to help make sure that I didn't look like a failure in her eyes and my peers' eyes. So I went out and started promoting it. So that is kind of a good introductory story as to what I'm going to talk about. And I've stolen a quote from Charles Darwin here. It's not the strongest that survived, nor the most intelligent, but those most innovative to change. It doesn't really go very well, but you get the point. It's more about being innovative, especially today with what's going on. So I've done a lot of work. I used to work for A.T. Kearney. I've done a lot of work with companies, and a lot of them have had a lot of failed ideas. And some of these ideas weren't bad. One in particular that I'm reminded of all the time is one at General Mills. Does anyone here work for General Mills? OK, good. So there's a product called Wahoos. Does anyone remember the Wahoos product? It was a chip line. No? Well, that's why. They had created Wahoos to compete with a Frito-Lay product. I, I don't remember what the Frito-Lay product was, but it was designed to compete with it, and it failed miserably. When they released it, like, nobody bought this. The distributors didn't want it. Nobody wanted it. I thought it tasted pretty good, but I wasn't their target market. So ever since that point, they always refer back to this Wahoo's chip line for any idea that comes up. So it's giving people the sense that if you come up with new ideas and you fail, that some, something bad's going to happen to you. And in fact, that's what happened after the Wahoos. I skipped ahead. The Wahoos story, most of the people on the Wahoos line were fired because it was such a disaster. I think that's the wrong approach. I don't think that that's the right approach at all. I think you should fail fast. You know, a lot of people talk about failing fast. I'm a big believer in that. Um, and what it did to that culture is it made it less innovative, not more innovative. So I'm here to talk to you about how do you improve the success odds. How do you make your innovative programs and, uh, and give it a higher probability? That's what I want to talk about today. So if you look at this conceptual idea of a funnel and what actually happens with, with ideas, whether you're using Spigot or whether you have an ideation program at your, at your work or, or uh, whatever program that you're, you're running today, you start with a brainstorming, then you kind of have the framing and then you have the execution, and then you have a solution that's either brought to market externally or internally, if it's kind of an internal idea. It isn't always about the big ideas, right? Sometimes it's a little incremental ideas that matter the most. But I think we're missing kind of a fourth aspect of this. I think we're missing influencers. And I'm going to define influencers in just a second. It's one thing to push ideas through the funnel. That's great. Vote up these ideas, and the best one will, uh, in this case, get to the bottom, and you actually execute on those ideas. But I think there's something missing. And I think what's missing are influential people and advocates, a community, if you will, that are not only participating in the ideation, and these could be internal influencers or external influencers, but I think what's missing is that you don't have influential people that are involved in the process because at the end of it, if you work with influencers, and, and this has been influencers, if you've, and this has been part of our research, those influencers will bring with them their followers. So you'll have an engaged community at the end of this process if you engage influential people during the process because like me with the reading program, They'll feel bought in, and they'll feel responsible for making it successful. One example of this, uh, I met with, I actually interviewed Guy Kawasaki two weeks ago. His book, Ape, whether you've heard of it or not, it's about self-publishing. 
and he self-published his self-published book. What he did was kind of remarkable because he invited 1,000 people to help him write this book. In doing so, he had 1,000 people buy that book day one. So he had a built-in community of people that bought the book day one because he involved them in the entire process, whether it was editing, ideas, things that they'd noticed, what have you. But from day one, he involved them in the process. No publisher, I published a book, no publisher's gonna let you do that. They don't want that content getting out into you know, the, the wild, especially with the internet. But he did it, and day one had 1,000 book sales, and he's gone on, I think it's, it's hit a, a bestseller. So my point is, what kind of community do you want when an idea is released? Do you want no community? Kind of a burnt down, I use this rainforest example. Or do you want a thriving ecosystem that's ready to accept your ideas and make it popular? I know the answer for me. And I like this chart that they've come up with, kind of a periodic chart of innovation, but I wanted to make a few modifications, or maybe additions, if you don't mind. And one is influencers, the other is advocacy. I think we need those two pieces to this to improve the, pro the chances that the product, idea, what have you, coming to market, or even internal, will be successful. Why? So why influencers? For me, when I look at the communities in my research, the, com the currency of the community is trust. If there's no trust, then there's no way your community is gonna buy from you or listen to you or what have you. So, th so that's kind of the currency. And in fact, when I talk to their customers, 73% of them said they need that trust to feel good about buying a product or service. They want that trust. But most brands, as you can see, are outside the circle of trust, right? That's where most brands exist, at least the ones that I talk to, and I talk to a lot of them. And it turns out that it boils down to kind of this trust equation. Credibility, kind of in the form of expertise, is required, and that's an expertise in your product or field. It's reliability, a great product or service, you've got to have it, no matter what. If you have influencers, if you've got President Obama helping you releasing a product, if you don't have a good product, chances are high probability it's not gonna get purchased. So you, you gotta have a good product. And then a familiarity or comfort with that product or, or brand. And then, kind of in the denominator is self-orientation, the focus needs to be on your customers and not you. There's so many brands today that I see where the focus on their advertising, their messaging, even in social media is on, on them. Or in our example here, on the brand. The focus needs to be on them. And if you solve this trust equation and you marry it with an innovation program, the probability of success in our research goes up dramatically. And in fact, trust community equals revenue. Now I know there's a lot of different ways of having an innovation program, bringing products to market, uh, whether it's internal or external. But in our example here, the more trust you have and that involves influencers who carry trust with them and their community, the higher likelihood they're gonna buy your product. So who do people trust? Our research shows it's employees, friends, and family first in the inner circle, and then the outer circle, it's influencers, people that influence you and me. Think about people you tune into for information, whether it's a clothing line. You know, these are the taste makers. These are the people that um, if you're out to, uh, buying some kind of a, a software program or a phone or what have you, you're tuning into. These are the influential people that can ch change markets. And we, we identify two types. So when you do an innovation program, it's important to, to recognize there's two types of inno innovators, or I'm sorry, influencers. The first being rainmakers. These are the people that are well respected, their opinions highly valued, they're trend makers, market movers, they're very well connected. The other is kind of a groundswell. These are people that in your industry, maybe there's hundreds, maybe 50, in your industry are kind of niche influencers. When combined together, they have a very powerful impact on a new product or idea or what, whatever you're bringing to market. So there's are two types that we, that we identified. And why I think you should engage both is one is kind of top down, the other bottom up. And if you've got these two people or two types of influencers 
involved in your process, the, again, going back to the probability of having a successful product when it's released goes up dramatically. This is in, in, in our recent research. And I kind of named this the Oprah Book Club effect. You know if Oprah were to talk about my book or anyone else's in this room, the sales of that book would go up dramatically, right? We all know that. There are rainmakers in your industry, maybe not as powerful or as influential as Oprah, that can totally change the way your product or new idea is received. And that, even, that could even be internally. You could do it like what my principal did at school. You find the people internally within your organization that can promote an idea, make it their own, and push it out to the rest of your employees. It doesn't have to be external. I know my focus today is a little bit more on external, but it can be internal as well, which, which we saw. And then you look at influencers. You got rainmakers, there's one or two in an industry, then you have influencers, hundreds, depending on the size of your industry. They are already in the circle of trust within the community. They're the ones collectively that are pushing your product. Chances are much greater that you're gonna have a su successful product at the end of the funnel, the innovation funnel. Important to, uh, to understand. So the bottom line, customers trust influencers. They might trust you. But they certainly trust influencers. They trust the inner circle too, the employees, uh, their friends, family. And if they like your product, it leads to revenue. So I wanna marry innovation with influencers because I've seen dramatic results as a result of do, kind of doing an A-B test. It wasn't the same product, uh, but we'll get into that. So why influencers? Think about it. When your product comes to market, what is the awareness of your new, pro new idea or product? It's, it's typically very low, unless you're like Apple, where everyone's anticipating it. But how many of us can say we have products that we're releasing that are like Apple? Not many, if any. So a lot of it is hidden. You might have the greatest product in the world. I know a lot of products out there today no one knows anything about. Why? Because the right people aren't talking about it, whether it's the press, the influencers, advocates, what have you. They haven't built a community around their brand that's really promoting their uh, product or service because it's too new. People are waiting for tastemakers to chime in and say this is a great product. They're waiting for influential people or media to say it's a great product, what have you. But what if you never get that and you have a great product? That's a shame. It shouldn't happen. So the other reason you want to connect with influencers is because they have great connections. How many of you watch the Shark Tank? Wow, a lot of you. Then you're, you're gonna know what I'm talking about. These people are like angel investors. They give out 50,000 to 100,000 dollars. Sometimes it's more than that, but it's roughly in that range for a percent of your company. But what's, what they don't talk about often enough, and what's more important here, is that these people have connections. So when I deal with influencers in my line of work, my, the influencers I have, the better benefit to them, not only is endorsing your brand or product, but also their connections. So let's take Mark Cuban, for example. There was somebody that came on that, that made pretzels. Now Cuban, if you don't know, owns a bunch of vending companies that you, know, you could just plug a product into and it goes wild and, and crazy because it's all at sports venues. So he invested $50,000 in this pretzel company, but more importantly, overnight, the person presenting to this, uh, this team and ultimately Cuban investing, was able to instantly overnight push pretzels and distribute them into all his, his vending uh, organizations. So overnight, with his connections, made the company successful. That's what these rainmakers, these influencers can do for you and why it's important to get connected with them early on and involve them in the process of innovation. Another challenge is creating this groundswell. And remember I talked about the hundreds of influencers creating a groundswell for you. You're not paying them. You're, they're helping create this groundswell because they participated in the innovation process. Very important and some benefit that you get from working with, with influencers. Also, I, I go back to this, you know, a lot of times the new product comes to market, it's ignored. Why is it ignored? Because there's so much noise out there. It is really hard to get above the fold, especially with a new product that's coming out in a crowded, a crowded field already. So don't be ignored. That's one of the reasons to use uh, influencers as well. So I always like to ask, at launch, do you want a community that looks barren or do you want a community that's 
got a rich ecosystem that's alive and well, that's ready to buy your product or uh, um, embrace your idea. So influencers help build community. They help build trust, right? I mean, they're transferring their trust of, of the influencer to your product if they like your product or idea. That's really important. And bottom line, community and trust equals dollars. So when you got all the ideas coming down that funnel, when they go to market, you got a community of people ready to buy them. That's why working with influencers is so important. So it's one thing for me to stand up here and just talk about, you know, proselytize about why you need influencers part of your innovation campaign. It's another to see who's actually doing it. So I've got a couple uh, that I know pretty well. So how many of you have heard of the democracy campaign by Mountain Dew? One or two. You all should know about this campaign. You should Google it when I'm done. What they did is they created a competition. They said, submit your flavors, and they have some of their flavors on their own. Submit flavors that we will actually develop if it's voted to be the best flavor. So they created this competition, but they took it a step further. It wasn't just a voting uh, mechanism on a website. They narrowed it down to three flavors that were that were uh, the highest rated or highest voted uh, as an initial phase. And they said, okay, now we're gonna pick some teams to represent these flavors. And those teams were funded, and those teams just started developing YouTube videos, blog posts, they started creating their own communities of advocates around each of those three flavors. And so they, they called this the Flavor Nation. And the end result was, after all of the, the, it was kind of like, it was run like a political campaign. It was really quite remarkable. You had three teams that were competing against each other, and they drove so much activity because they all wanted to win that they had, in just, I think it was a 60-day period, 700,000 new Mountain Dew Facebook fans. Um, they had cha their channel views on their YouTube channel were 2,957. That was for the winning one. Channel views, not video views. Um, they had an additional 19,000 Mountain Dew Twitter followers. And they ultimately, they came out with a flavor called Whiteout. I don't know if you've seen it or not. But day one, as they told me, when Whiteout came to market, they had a huge community of, of people that went to the stores to buy this particular flavor. They were sold out, day one. Now, I haven't done a follow-up to find out if it's continued to do, to do well. But my point is, that they had built a community of people so they just didn't release a flavor blindly and hoping it would be successful. They used a community of influencers and people that were helping to promote that product right out of the gate. Very, very uh, successful. So let's take a B2B example. You know, a lot of people talk about B2C. I like to talk about B2B. I have a company now, it's called Nestivity. They build communities for Twitter. You know, tw Twitter right now, I love Twitter, but there's no, there's no like Facebook fan page for Twitter or Google Plus page for Twitter. So they've taken Twitter and they've met, they're making communities out of it. So they've engaged, let's talk about their goals first. They've wanted to engage with rainmakers and influencers to help them develop this community. They had that conceptual idea of what the Twitter community would look like, but they didn't really know it would, wear, would work for these uh, heavy Twitter users what I call rainmakers, and some of the other influencers as well. So they were looking for not only people to help them innovate that product, but also endorse it along the way. They're more likely, these rainmakers are more likely, these Oprahs are more likely to endorse a product, by the way, if they're involved in the process. We talked about that before. And they also wanted their connections. So if you look at who these rainmakers are, they're heavily, heavily connected. I mean, they can totally change the trajectory of a company by working with them directly. So that was the goals, and I kind of set up the goals for them. So what did we do? We took some time and we identified the rainmakers and influencers. We met with the, the three rainmakers that they used over dinner. Again, highly influential people in the industry. We demoed the product and got their feedback. So that was kind of phase one. Phase two is we built out some of the features from these influencers and we put them into the product. That validated the new and improved product, and we got their commitment to promote and use us. That's what we did. 
And the results, and we haven't even launched yet, the results are over 500 beta users have signed up in 24 hours. We just launched this, soft launched this at a conference I was at a couple weeks ago. And the awareness, if you all use social tools, went up from zero to 25%, share of voice. And these rainmakers are using the product for their own needs. So here we have influential people before the product's officially released, using it, promoting it, and helping them develop it. We know that when we get to South by Southwest, that this thing is gonna shoot like a cannon out of the gate. So, I'm always asked, so what's in it for the influencers? One, monetization and influence. You might have to pay them, you might not, just depends on who you are. They like fame. They wanna keep adding to their fame, more followers, more recognition, what have you. But the third, I think most importantly, is a lot of them do want to be part of something bigger. And I think that's important to, to take note of when we're talking about innovation. They want to be part of something bigger than themselves, something they've helped develop, brought to market, and they saw it as a success. That's something to play on in our research, in my conversations with these influencers. But is this hard work? Uh, the answer is yes. Can I do this myself? You can do it yourself. It's arduous, though, to kind of manage these people that are inundated with requests on a regular basis. It's very difficult, but you can do it. And I suggest you do do it. Take the time. There's not a, there's not a lot of them. If you've got a big product you're releasing or some big idea or some social cause, whatever innovation program you have, get them included in your brand or organization early on. Managing groups of influencers is even harder. And, you know, it, it's, it, it is challenging. I'll talk about how we, we manage it here in a second. But managing groups of these influencers is even harder. But I, ultimately, they all want to be involved in an innovative process, if, especially if they like you and your brand. Some of the secret weapons, if it were me, I would use a system like a platform like Spigot. I'd invite them all to the Spigot platform. Early on, I'd have all these influencers helping out with your innovation program, whether it's voting it up, voting it down, whether it's getting them more engaged in the process, whatever it is, I would use a platform like Spigot. It's not because they invited me here, it's because it's the right platform for what, the, what we're trying to do with, uh, with influencers. So kind of to summarize, I think it's very important to find out who your influencers are in your industry. You know, find people that can help ideate and build community and advocacy early on. Early on in the funnel process, the innovation process, because the end result is gonna be phenomenal. Then I'd invite them to kind of engage in the, in the process all the way through, especially at the end. You can train them how to get, to help build that community for your organization, for your product, for your idea that's coming to market. And this could be internal too. Like, I, like my high school, the principal took me aside, wanted me to help with a reading program. This can happen internal as well. It doesn't just have to be external. And build that advocacy into the funnel. I know I've said this over and over again, but it's really, really effective, especially when you've got a community of people, a community of buyers ready to go day one once the product is, is released. So most products or ideas, what have you, that come to market internally, externally, kind of look like this. Not all of them. Maybe you've got a big advertising campaign around it, a uh, very expensive one. But what I like to see, and what I think the future is, is more like this, where you've got influential people with communities and followers that are ready to engage with your product or service. This is what I think the future is for ideation. This will help improve the probability that your idea, your product, whatever it is you're bringing to market will be successful. I think this is the future. This is what we're seeing. So with that, I'm done. And I, uh, if you have any questions, you can come up and see me later. I think they're gonna cut me off here pretty soon. But if I could, I could leave you with one thing, I'd say a lot of, a lot of companies have the Wahoo syndrome where they have products that have failed in the past and people are afraid to bring up new ideas, I'll tell you that by partnering with influential people internally and externally and going to management and saying, 
you know, this is what we want to do with this new idea. I've got a built-in community. I've got support. I've got the process. I've got the plan done. Not only will, should management say, okay, let's go for it, but they should support you and your efforts in bringing those ideas to market. So thank you very much for having me today. And if there's any questions, come, come up here later and see me. Thank you.